Hello everyone, my name is Stella Odiasi and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Ideas Winter Debate 2020. So we have um, two sessions, uh, we'll be quite busy in the next two hours and 10 minutes or thereabouts. And uh, before we actually go into the first session, I think it's appropriate to acknowledge those who have been part of getting us where we are uh, this evening. We'd like to affirm and appreciate um, two of IDS's uh, team who inspired the IDS debate series. I'm talking about the highly accomplished Professor Robert Chambers, the one, the only, and IDS's tireless Director of Teaching and Learning, Dr. Linda Waldman. We also have here uh, with us, and who've been part of this process, two international debating champions, gurus, Marcela Valdez, who also happens to be an IDS alumni, and Ruben Sanchez, and uh, they've been working with the teams and will provide some feedback. A big thank you also to the IDS Communications with and Guru, James Andrews, who's done most of the heavy lifting for this event. Thank you everyone and welcome. Um, before we introduce the teams, perhaps Marcella and Ruben would like to just share a few of their reflections with us in the next five minutes. Would you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I think debate is an activity that actually helps everyone. It helps them to understand that there are two sides to every debate or to every topic that we want to discuss. And that is something that's really valuable in a world where we live with echo chambers and with ideas being continuously reinforced. And we need to understand that um, listening to the other side and understanding what they're saying, but also understanding that it's some something logical behind those ideas. It's something that approaches us to actually debating and constructing new arguments and new lines of and a new paths to, to actually resolve the most important problems that we have today in society. So debate is it's an amazing activity and I hope that you actually take um, a lot for a lot from it. And well also like I think it's really valuable for development, mainly because we're having the most important debates that humankind can have. And and the ideas, for example, about deep growing or green growing, um, or for example, foreign aid, or for example, um, gender equality, and so many things that we need to discuss and continue to discuss and debunk the ideas that are currently in the mainstream political um, scenario that we have to start um, like clearing and understanding to actually try to create new paths toward the best kind of answers to solve the problems that we have today in development. I think that it's something that is really valuable from debate. And well, I think that Marcela um, can say more about this, but um, thank you very much for having me here. And I am expecting to see great debates and to actually give you a lot of feedback. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Marcela? Um, yes. Uh Ruben and me really wanted to work further into bringing debate beyond competitive debating because we, we believe that the skills that you can get from debating are really important. The way it can make you feel more confident, uh, saying what you believe and the way it can help you find your voice and actually saying out loud what you think in a way that's very organized and very easy to understand. And I think it's very important for development as we live in a world in which we unfortunately need to fight for what we believe in and we need to fight in order to get our rights. So being able to have tools such as argumentation, such as rebuttal, such as how to choose the words and the right arguments to push depending on the audience and the other person that's going to be listening to me is very important for us in order to be able to fight for our rights, to fight against bureaucrats that like doing things in just one way and when we want to change the way things are being done, to fight for a change in the status quo. So that's why we are working so hard in order for these skills to be more available for people. And we are really, really happy that you are so interested in this and we are very proud to be helpful in this process. Sorry about that. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you, Ruben, as well. So we'll go straight into the very first debate. And the motion for this session, 
This house believes that low-income countries should aspire to be more like China than the West. And here to argue for the West, we have a team of three. Leading that team, we have Dr. Martin Pearson, formerly of the London School of Economics, now a research fellow at IBS, where he leads the research program on international taxation at the International Center for Tax and Development. We have Irfan Supradono, who is a postgraduate master's degree student in development studies, but was formerly an intern at the President's Office for the Republic of Indonesia and has extensive experience working in the private sector. Yvonne Asamoni, postgraduate master's degree student in gender and development at IBS, uh, formerly and currently coordinator of a girls' education program for a local nonprofit in Ghana. And here to argue for China are the one, the only, Professor Big Moore, political economist, IDS senior research fellow, and founding chief executive officer of the International Center for Tech, Tax and Development, Ayushi Misra, who's a master's student in development studies with eight years prior experience as a banker in India, and Yu Sin, who's doing her MA in development studies at IDS and said I should make sure I introduce her here today as a Chinese who comes from Japan, just majored in education from the Hiroshima University in Japan. And we'll go straight into it. I'd like to invite Martin to argue in favor for the first five minutes. Um, we're arguing against, so I think it will be Mick's team that will be going first. Oh, sorry about sorry. that. Sorry. Sure. Sorry, go ahead, Mick. <laughs> OK. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's debate. Um, my name is Yu Song. So I start. Um, this debate believes that low-income countries should aspire to be more like China than like the West, because we interpret this portion in a very practical way. So in practice, no low-income country can aspire to be more like China, and then they expect anything to happen just because they aspire, right? They need to do something to make something happen. So the practical question of this motion is what can low income countries learn from China that they can sensibly adapt, expect to adapt and adopt to their own circumstances? So firstly, why not the West? Um, it is well known to all that almost all, most of the, most of the low income countries, they were colonized by the West. And uh, when I mean colonize, I mean here, colonize, colonize them, what West take to the world. And for the others of low income country, they were in a new colonial relationship to the Western power, which means for them country, for this country, they already have long been deeply exposed to the Western ideologies and the pressure to adopt Western style government. Is it working well? I, of course, no, right? That's why we have today's debate to think about a, a solution for them. Why? Um, because of course we recognize, we admire that there are some advantages of Western values of democracy, of their elections, of their accountability. But on the other hand, this aspect alone, I often generate some like uh, incompetent and malicious leader. Just see the United States, their recent president, right? Um, terrible. And there are enough instability in their senior positions of their um, office of the government and of their policies, which caused too much turnover. And then especially in this age, with the growing income inequality, there are too many influence of money in their politics. So as a result, few governments in low income countries, they are capable of dealing with the increasing challenges in front of them, such as climate change, such as poverty. And in these days, with the influence of COVID pandemic, low income countries situation even more tougher than before. So at this time, China as a very successful country, which never evade any other countries, we definitely think China can provide some valuable lessons about how to deal with those challenges to balance what low income countries have learned from the West. So to be more precise, here are some three important things we just pick up briefly. 
The first one is when they make some policies in China, the governing institutions always have a long-term perspective, long-term worry, which will be very important in the development of China. And then uh, beside here we have uh, called the intelligent policy making process, which contain two key, uh, key elements. The first one is deeply investigation and deliberation on a broad policy options not only including the local government, but also including the central government, police, provincial levels, city levels, and township. So all of them, they will broadly attend to the policy making pro process. And then there is a flexible and adaptive and uh, an experimental approach to policy implementations. So you might heard about the open and reform policies in 1980s, but at the beginning, this opening policy is not it's just conducted into four city to see the what outcomes if it was successfully achieved and then they conduct this policy into the whole China. So this is what we call the experimental approach. And this is the second point, intelligent policy making. And the third point is we have some technique for maintaining a balance of power right between the state institutions and the big business in China in the capitalist economy. Uh, Jack Ma, almost the richest man in China, but uh, within this balanced power, such worry, you know, very rich person or some like interest groups or protocracy, they will not gonna to run the state, run the China. So this is a bigger difference between China and the West. So above all, about this, we think this can just balance the absent idea in the uh, in these low-income countries. And finally, you know. From my humble perspective, I have to say, as a Chinese, not everything about China is perfect. So China also has so many things to learn from the rest of the world, including low-income countries. But if you ask me how low-income countries can learn from China, here it is, more important things. So please start looking east. Thank you. Thank you very much, you, And I um, would like to invite Team West, the first speaker for Team, team West. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> so, good evening, colleagues. Low-income countries should not aspire to be like anywhere. They should define a notion of development based on their own contexts, drawing on the experience of other countries where that's relevant. So the proponents of this motion thus need to show that low-income countries can draw more inspiration from China than from anywhere in the West. That's anywhere in Western Europe, North America, or the Antip Antipodes. Of course, it's possible to draw the wrong lessons from both the West and the Chinese experience, but that's not an issue here. Our contention is simply that China does not offer a richer vein from which to draw than the whole of the West. We're going to offer four reasons for this. I'll cover the first two and my colleague Yvonne will discuss the second two later. So I'm going to explain, first of all, how the Western world offers more useful examples of effective institutions than can be found in China. And secondly, how the Chinese case is too historically, geographically, and culturally specific to be useful elsewhere. Yvonne's then going to talk about inequality in two ways. First of all, over women's and LGBTQI rights. And secondly, over income and wealth. So to begin, the Western world offers more useful examples of effective institutions than can be found in China. We're not saying that all Western institutions are suitable for lower income countries, but rather that, ra rather that there's a larger and more diverse range of successful examples from which to draw. Consider first management of the economy. Some might consider the close interaction between the state and private firms in the planning of the economy to be a benefit of the Chinese model in contrast with the free market model of the West. But that contrast rests on a fiction if you want state-owned firms and national champions, the West can offer that. Look at Airbus, Airbus, the European aircraft manufacturer, or the French railways, for example. The West also offers a wide range of different models at the level of firms and at, uh, of societies, from the liberal approach in the US to the coordinated management of the economy in Germany. Each model has its advantages and its disadvantages. Secondly, consider managing the wealth from oil and mining industries which is a major challenge for many lower income countries. The West here offers positive examples where China doesn't, such as Australia and Norway. Finally, 
While each country needs to design its overall model of economic development itself, human rights are rightly considered a universal aspect. Nobody would take seriously the idea that these are better protected in China than in the West. Just look at what's happening in Hong Kong as it transitions from British to Chinese rule. So that's the first part of our argument. The second part is to turn and look specifically at China and how its own experience of development is specific in terms of history, geography and culture in ways that make it difficult to apply this elsewhere. So I'll make three points. Firstly, Chinese civilization has been a powerful force in the global economy for centuries. While today we might think of China as a global leader in electronics and computing, the four great inventions most associated with China in history are centuries old. The compass, gunpowder, paper making and printing. China didn't achieve its leadership position today from a standing start. Meanwhile, some Western countries were considered economically and politically underdeveloped until surprisingly recently. Spain, Portugal and Greece were all still under dictatorships 50 years ago. So the simple contrast between uh, China as a, a departing from a low income country situation in recent era, in recent memory, doesn't quite work. Secondly, most lower income countries are today still suffering the consequences of colonialism and neo-colonialism, including, and the other team must acknowledge this, by China itself. While China was occupied at various times, it doesn't have a recent history of being colonized in a sustained and systematic way, in contrast to, say, Ireland, which is a Western country. It did not have to begin its current era of development from a place of dependency, as most lower income countries have had to, and that reduces the value of the Chinese example to lower income countries. Finally, size is important. China's growth strategy relies on its vast territory and workforce. Small lower income countries will not be able to emulate its size. Consider artificial intelligence, in which global success relies on having immense amounts of data. China has a competitive advantage because of the size of its population, as well as the lack of data protection. In my own work on taxation, I studied why China's approach to taxing multinational companies may not benefit lower income countries. Here is a quote from a Chinese government document on exactly that subject. It says China has a huge population and a fast growing middle class that form a great market capacity and huge consumer groups. This factor is unique in the world and inimitable, it cannot be copied by other small and medium sized developing countries. I'll rest my case there for the first part of our argument. Thank you very much, Martin. And there's a, an imaginary applause going on. <laughs> And I'd like to invite the second speaker for Team West, please. Nice. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My pleasure to uh, talk after Martin. My colleague, Yusun, just gave you a Sorry, list of three. Sorry. It's supposed to be the second speaker from Team West. I think that is that Yvonne. Oh, West? Really? Yes. Sorry about that. Sorry, I thought Sorry. it would go swap swap. No, no, the second speaker from Team West is supposed to come on now. And then, yeah. Oh. So I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. We can't <laughs> wait to hear you speak. Sorry about that. <laughs> right, so the second speaker from Team West. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I am speaking against the motion that low-income countries should aspire to be more like China than the West. And um, the proponents of the motion have already made some claims, which um, I would like to make some comments on before I move on to my main points. We have already made our stance clear that we are moving away from the simplistic arguments that low-income countries should aspire to be like the West or like China. We are saying, and as Martin had, has already made clear, we are establishing the premise that low-income countries can draw inspiration from other countries to establish their own model, but preferably they should draw inspiration from the West and not from China. And as um, was already said, that low-income countries have been colonized. Yes, we agree that there has been colonization from the West, but also low-income countries are moving away from um, that whatever kept them bound to their colonial masters. And that's specifically why we are saying we should not 
aspire to be like the West. We can draw from them, but if we keep emulating and transposing exactly what they did, then colonization is still going on. And so now to my main point, um, we see that countries in the West have moved progressively in the areas of gender equity and ensuring the rights of other minority groups. Women's rights have come a long way since Beijing 1995. Ironically, this was in China, but when we, we come later to see that China is nowhere close to the West in terms of women's rights. Legislations have been advanced and countries in the West have chalked significant progress on institutional mechanisms put in place to recognize other gender minorities. In the 2019 gender gap report, we can see countries like Iceland excelling in um, bridging the gap between the genders. Scotland is another shining example, which very recently made tampons and pads free for women. And this um, singular move is going to solve period poverty for up to 10% of girls in the UK. Now, if this move is emulated by low income countries, it can solve period poverty for up to 50% of girls who miss school between one and four days every month. Now let's look at the state of China. The global gender gap report of 2019 mentions that since 2006, when China was the 63rd position, up until now, it has slipped from the 63rd to the 106th position. This is not surprising since certain social cultural practices in China, such as the leftover women's phenomenon, continues to push women to um, a subservient position. Although these practices, some of these social cultural practices on paper have been abolished, but still we see some practices like the foot binding, which until only six years ago was actively um, there were measures put in place to abolish them. So some of these things are not very surprising that China is still at its 106th position. The report also shows that the political landscape remains dominated by men with only two ministerial positions held by women. No wonder that China is at where it is. If we have only two women in ministerial roles, there will be no women voices and therefore um, resources and facilities to advance women's rights will not um, be passed. Also on LGBTQR rights, countries of the West have legislations that have protected individuals who identify with this community. Same-sex marriage have been legalized in some countries of the West, but this is the opposite situation for China. Although China has the largest LGBTQR community in the world, some low income countries have draconian legislations that continue to oppress people who identify or people in the LGBTQI community. And therefore in this case as well, we say that countries, the low income countries have a lot to draw from the West to ensure that people in the LGBTQI community also are able to contribute to the development of their, of their countries and of their economies. So China as well, um, in this case does not give much inspiration to low income countries. And now moving on to the economic front, we have seen China's economy skyrocket over the past years, but this is not necessarily a sign of, in, this is not necessarily a sign of balance or stability. China's economic growth relies heavily on exports and uncoordinated consumptions. And we saw how that once again um, was affected when because of COVID they could not export to other countries. In spite of its rapid growth, income inequality is on the rise in China. This inequality is reflected in large rural urban disparity and associated disparities in access to public services. China's model of development is unique in many ways, one of which is its tax reforms. However, this and other accompanying reforms should not be emulated blindly on the misconceptions that tax reforms can revive an economy without the structural premises required. And as Martin has already stated, some of these structural reforms low income countries do not have. And so it is simply not, a, it's, there's simply no inspiration for low income countries to have anything to draw from China. In conclusion, historically, we have seen how naively copying strategies from other countries have affected low income countries. The conditions may not favor the same models copied from other countries, even if we transpose the exact model into the context of low income countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Yes, there's a virtual applause, we're all clapping. And I'd like to invite the next speaker for Team China. That, that will be you, Mick. Yes, I'll try again. Hello. 
Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So my uh, colleague Yusun just gave you a list of three things, very important things, that we believe that low-income countries can learn from China. I'm going to expand a little on those, but let me just say by way of introduction, these things are not deeply embedded in Chinese history. They're not embedded in the genes of Chinese people. These lessons are actually lessons that the Chinese Communist Party itself has learned over its history of now 99 years in the course of facing and overcoming some really uh, serious challenges and in opposition, including uh, combating a large scale Japanese military invasion in the 1930s, defeating Chinese warlords in the 1940s, facing up to a major confrontation with the West for 40 years during the Cold War, and now managing to preside over a very dynamic capitalist economy that could easily have swept the party away. So these are you know, real lessons learned by China that can now be learned by the rest of the world. First lesson is maintain the capacity to think long-term. Uh, note that uh, there are well over 3,000 party schools in China where the Communist Party cadres go to get trained and retrained and retrained and encouraged to think about all kinds of things, including the future. Um, the party and the state have been observing what's happening in the world economy. And um, I have to say, Yvonne, you're right that historically China has been dependent on exports. But if you look at the last five years, the Chinese government has very rapidly reoriented the whole Chinese economy towards domestic consumption as a result of this forethought and realization that they couldn't carry on that way. Similarly, um, China has invested very heavily in leading edge technologies so that it, such that it's no longer just a major economic power, it's now a major technological power in area, areas like uh, electric vehicles, uh, electric storage batteries, artificial intelligence, etc. So that's first lesson. Second lesson is that the Chinese have learned a rather unique way of controlling a very large and very complex public bureaucracy so that it actually does what the central government wishes it to do in terms of being flexible and changing policy rather than resisting. There are various elements of that and I'm only going to sketch them very quickly. Um, the first element is what is sometimes called directed improvisation, which essentially means central government sets policy objectives. But after that, there is a very intensive process of lower levels of government and party working out what those objectives mean for their particular province or county or whatever, and trying to experiment with ways of achieving those objectives without simply following a blueprint from the center. Um, related to that is um, a process of continuously examining the success of these different experiments towards the same ultimate goal, working out which one is better and generalizing that. And behind that is a very impressive effort of meritocracy and continuous appraisal of public servants and members of the Communist Party so that they are recruited on merit, promoted on merit and continuously um, encouraged to, to do better. Third lesson, and briefly, is that the Chinese Communist Party knows that contemporary capitalism is, while very impressive, is very dangerous. Because combinations of very wealthy people, very large corporations, and plutocrats and finance capital can, as we see most clearly in the United States, more or less conspire together to take over politics. Um, democratic politics can easily be swept away on a flood of money, is what we've seen in the US and is a threat in many other countries in the West. So the Chinese Communist Party has developed ways of living with large scale successful capitalism, but keeping it under control. And there are many dimensions of this. I will just mention two or three. 
Uh, one is trying to recruit most leading capitalists into the party where they can keep an eye on them and also help shape their views. Another one is having uh, party cells in most large businesses. And a third one recently is taking a lot of steps to clip the wings of very large companies that have either been investing speculatively overseas in recent years, or most recently um, companies like uh, Alphabet and under Jack Ma that threatened to become politically independent. And I think maintaining that balance between economic power and political power is something that is very important and the Chinese seem to do it better than the rest of us. So our concluding point, Stella, is that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese state are thinking and learning organizations in a way that I frankly think is more impressive than uh, in the great majority of countries in the West. Thank you very much, Mick. And <laughs> as if you knew I was about to just uh, give you a loving wave to say <laughs> your time is up. So at this point, we'll open up the floor for the, for the both teams, the, the team for the West and the team for China for another 10 minutes to sort of um, share with us uh, points that they were not able to make within the first five minutes. So we have the open debate session for the next 10 minutes starting now. Okay. Does anyone like to go first? Should I? Okay, oh. sorry. Okay, let's have you first and then are you sure. second. Thank okay. you. So thank you. you have a, one minute, please. Okay, thank you for your ideas. I think most of them are support the Chinese side. Uh, you are mentioned a lot about uh, China's social inequality and the gender inequality. I think inequality exists all over the world, not only China, but also, also the West. You know, where is, if we, we use capitalist method, where is the capital, where is the inequality? Since ca capital will cause inequality, it's not because our society, it's not because of Chinese model or West model, it's because the capitalist society method of them. And uh, you also mentioned some gender equality in China. Yes, gender equality in China is increasing. We, we, we admire that, but, the gender is also not not so equal in the West. Look at the in UK spokesman. Most of them are spokesmen. Most of them are men. And look at the United States president. How many of them are men, right? Look at, look at the office member of here, the party member of here. How many of them are men? And uh, also, I think you mentioned that Chinese people, Chinese model is unique. Yes, Chinese people, Chinese model are unique, but we are unique because we are keep learning. We are pragmatic. Pragmatic, okay. We are pragmatic. We always learn. We learn everything, but okay. not Chinese model. Chinese model it just tell you how to learn. Thank you, you. Sorry, I have to interrupt, and uh, let's hear from Ayushi. Thank you very much. Three quick points, which is uh, which are absolutely pers It's my perception at the end of the day. Uh, first, uh, that. Uh, I felt that maybe we are moving slightly away from the topic because when we say what low income uh, country should aspire to be, it means that something that they don't already have, you know, you don't aspire to be something that you already are in the first sense. So they are already exposed to the Western world for so many years. So I don't understand why would they aspire to be like them. They have been exposed to the Western world and it might have worked for some, it might not have worked for some. Secondly, what I would write, uh, I don't know uh, what uh, they meant when they said, uh, when they were talking about uh, management of the economy, because you know most of the financial setbacks that the world has seen, sadly, they emerged from the West. And uh, another point was that uh, whatever models that uh, my opposing team had spoken about of the West, they have already been adopted by lower income countries, by developing countries what new can the West teach us? That is my point. You know, over these years, we've had their railways, we've had their postal services. I'm from India, and I know how deep rooted the Western culture is. You know, I studied in a French school, and uh, I, I'm here studying in, the, in, in UK now. So what new can the West teach us? So these are my points that I would like some answers on and some insight on. Thank you very much, Ayushi. Um, okay. we have uh, any can I respond? Oh, there you go, Evan. The floor is yours. Okay, so uh, several responses toward what the uh, China team said. First, we think that the, the 
uh, all the you know the gender equality and also the in, in economic inequality is uh, relatively worse in China than in the West countries because we believe like for example uh, uh, China's political are, are male for example and also there is a you know a lack of uh, women friendly policies in uh, in China and what worse is that there is no uh, you know political pressure. Uh, from the uh, grassroots society in China, because basically, po uh, you know, political uh, participation in China is being pressed by the CCP. And second, we believe that uh, what we offer is that the West is not a single model like in China. We have a varied model, like we have like Scandinavian model, and also uh, we have a liberal model, uh, like in the US. So there's a lot of uh, low-income countries could learn if they're not suitable with you know the US model. Then you can you know learn uh, from Scandinavian model like China, like Sweden or Norway to create a more uh, economic equality and also gender equality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think they are they are learning. But yeah, China, China. I said not everything about China is good. Good. China is is bad in the gender equality. But how can you teach them? As at the West, are you are you better than? Yeah, you are better better than before. But how can you teach them? Are you achieve already achieve gen, gender equality in your country? You didn't achieve them, right? We are taking the same actions about that all over the world. And thank you. Okay, are you see your hand is up? We can't hear you, are you see you're on mute. Would you so like I'm to unmute? Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So uh, I just wanted to know uh, when Irfan was talking, he was talking about the Scandinavian countries and it's not only about gender inequality. I mean, it's a rampant problem everywhere. As a woman, I uh, refuse to uh, you know, accept this comparison that there's one woman who's exploited or there are 10. I don't want any women to be exploited, but I want to know whether you have any model in your head that you can let us, you know, or probably with it, we are not informed about that the West, Western culture has adopted that probably these countries are not aware of. Any creative model that you can think of that they should aspire to adopt, maybe to change the scenario, the present scenario? And also there has- I'll response. respond and then Irfan can come in. Okay. I'm not sure what um, Ayushi expects us to say anymore because I've already given you in terms of gender, um, equality, we have already given you some shining examples to, to that we aspire, we think low income countries should aspire to be. We are not saying stick to one model. And you have rightly told us what aspiration means. The fact that you have been exposed to something and have seen how it works does not mean that you stop when you haven't reached the level of aspiration you want to achieve. So yes, we have the, the West colonized low income countries. We were exposed to them. Now we are, we have the liberty to emulate what the models they have that we believe will work for us. So I'm not sure which arguments you, you are, I, I don't know where your arguments comes from, but all I'm saying is, when we, when we compare countries of the West and China, we all know how China censors a lot of things. Even um, grassroots women's organizations don't have the freedom and liberty to um, push the government for women's rights because everything that other organizations do, the government comes down hard on them. So okay. I'm not sure, I think, yeah, it's, it's pretty yeah. clear here. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you on one minute. Um, okay. You, you wanted to say something for one minute? Yeah, okay, and um, I think we, we don't need to talk about the gender issue. It's already the global issue, not only China, but also the, the West. And uh, we need to think about for the low income country, what is the most urgent issue for them? What they can learn from, this is the most important. This is what we want to talk about today. The most important for them actually is economic development, right? Economic go first, but you can say that within 40 years, from 1980s, China is as poor as Malawi. The poor, poor situation of them is the same, but 40 years past, China already become the second global GDP of, of the world, but Malawi is still a, as one of the poorest country of the world. So the 40 years past, what's happened in China? I think this is what they can exactly learn from China. We can, we can learn from, they can learn from the pragmatic in China's government. We always use the pragmatic as a fundamental goal. We always learn everything. We always make an innovation. Yes, okay. some people. Okay. Thank you, you. I'm sorry. Your one minute is up. Um... Uh, can I come in? Yes, please. Go ahead, Martin. Thank you. So just 
just to to respond on the point about uh, and to expand a bit our point about um, inequality. So um, he's right to say that China's economy has grown significantly over the last 40 years. But something else that has grown significantly in China since 1980 is inequality. Compared to 40 years ago, China is a much more unequal society. China is now more unequal than many Western countries. In fact, the top 1% in China earn, gain 50% of the income every year. Compare that to a country such as France, China is far more unequal. Now, of course, China is less unequal than a country than the United States, which is the shining example of inequality in the West. But what that teaches is simply, to come back to Ayushi's point, that um, Low-income countries have often been encouraged to learn the wrong lessons from the West, just to learn the neoliberal Washington consensus lessons from the West. And if they look elsewhere to European countries, which have grown in a more balanced, more equal way, they may be able to, to, to develop more effectively. Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, so I think we've, I believe we have uh, two minutes. Do we have, um, yes, Erfa? Okay, uh, so thank you. So I'm interested in what uh, basically Mick say that uh, China is good in you know balancing economic and also like the politics. So my question is like, uh, what is the definition? I mean, like we question like how this they're not clear in you know how balancing is this possible when we know that you know basically politic uh, you know uh, while ordinary Chinese is not able to you know say politically you know a gatherer or like you know openly criticizing the government, then how like you know uh, this balancing act can really happens while you know the Chinese Communist Party actively censor uh, any critic of government in even in like in offline also in online like in Weibo or in uh, you know any social media that exists in China thank you shall I answer that Stella? yes please for one minute me okay um, I think the very short answer to that is that um, you're right uh, there is no democracy in China and there's a lot of inequality and a lot of gender inequality. But I think the fundamental point here is it's not a balancing of popular power with capitalism, it's a balancing of state and party power with capitalism. And unless you have that, contemporary internationalized and finance financialized capitalism is in serious, serious threat of taking over the whole world and sweeping our so-called democracy away. And that we have to look at the future on this. And I think that, you know, the threat there is very big. Unless we have stronger, more effective, more far-seeing states, then democracy as we know it in the West is, I think, in serious danger. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Team China and Team West. Um, at this juncture, we'd like to invite questions from the general public and from our um, viewers and listeners. Um, I'm not sure um, whether we have any questions already up. James, do we have any questions up? We have a 15 minute window for questions from... No questions have been asked yet, but uh, to the attendees. If you'd like to type them into the chat and then Stella can read them out and uh, ask them to the panelists. Okay. I don't see any questions on the chat yet. Okay, shall we start? Okay, yeah. well, we so, get so, some questions so from the minute, public. Please. You, just a minute. This is for the public, just a minute. We'll get back to you. James, did you say you have questions? Okay, someone is typing. So can, we, can you hang on you? I'll read the questions to your teams and then you can answer them. I believe okay? Marcella has a question that uh, she could ask. Yes, thank you, James. So I think we have heard really interesting points and really important points on both sides of the house. So the side of China has told us, for example, that we can have more economic growth or how we can have a more meritocratic system. And the side on the West has told us that we can achieve better levels of equality in terms of, for example, economic equality or gender inequality. And I would like to ask both teams, uh, since you both acknowledge that there are positive th things on the other side, why do you think low income countries should prioritize, prioritize the benefit that you are all talking about on your sides of the house? 
Okay, could could um, Team West respond to that first, and then Team China? Okay, uh, can I respond? Sure, go ahead, Open. Okay, so uh, we think that the way, uh, that low income country should aspire to you know be more like West because in West is not like you know just a one development model. We have like uh, you know Scandinavian model. If you like prefer to you know social equality or you have, or you could have like UK model. You can have Germany model. You can have like also the US model, Australia model. So basically, it's like a lot of uh, uh, model that low income country could aspire to, and they can just like you know pick the best example from the uh, from all best policies from all the examples. While also we believe that the idea of meritocracy and all the benefit that China uh, team China delivered is not mutually exclusive. That you can have also like long term. Uh, thinking and also meritocracies, like the best people to run central bank in the West, for example. So we think that the uh, benefits that's better in our side, uh, and also we can you know, we can also have like state-owned companies in the West. While the benefit that the team China delivered is like you know it's not mutually exclusive. Number one and two is more dangerous because there is no you know poli uh, po less political transparency, so that people cannot you know uh, 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 pressure the politician if they do wrong. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Team China. Uh, since we we are talking about low income country of uh, low income country for them they are one of most of them are very poor country so we need to think about what is the most urgent issue for them and China used 40 years to develop it from one percent of global GDP to 16 percent of global GDP so Chinese model is just tell you when you have nothing what you can do what you can do to create everything so this is chinese model but and what this is what we think that low income country should learn from us since we use 40 years to from nothing to create everything and now we have everything in china okay thank you, thank you. so i have a question up here um, from Wei. it says low income countries biggest problem is about income so what lessons can be learned to become mid-income one um, can we have someone from Team China respond to that, please? Mick, you're on mute. Yeah, okay. Um, well, this is a planted question, you see, because uh, Wei actually teaches the students exactly classes on exactly this subject. Um, so he's the expert, so it's very unfair of him to even ask the question. So Wei, as you know, <laughs> China, as with other countries of East Asia, has shown quite a capacity over several decades now for establishing sufficient government control over and sufficient government influence over the private sector that the private sector responds in a relatively coordinated way to the signal that government sends. And this results on the whole in much uh, faster economic growth than the somewhat more wild west Western model where private investors are free to much freer to invest where they want. And uh, as we know, in the last 20 years, an awful lot of investment has been purely in the financial sector. And the financial sector is basically a way of making money out of having money, but it doesn't actually contribute very much to uh, material or other kinds of welfare of uh, any, any, any country in the world. Thank you, Mick. I have a second question for Team West. Is it, um, uh, could we also respond to that question, Stella? Okay. Would that be possible? Go ahead. Sure. Just because I think Mick is being a bit naughty in the way that he is uh, describing the Wild West as if the West is one homogenous lump of financialized, uh, uber wealthy elites uh, uh, out of control. Um, and of course, you do have some elements of that in some pockets of the West. And as we've acknowledged, the United States is probably not the greatest example to follow in that regard. But coordination is what some Western economies have got exactly right and do really very well. If you look at the way in which countries of Northern Europe operate, there is a close coordination between industry and government and labor, but it works within a democratic context in a way that uh, it maintains their respect for human rights in a much more effective way than the Chinese model. It works within a, within a democracy and it works at the level of um, negotiation between those three social parties. 
And if you look at the history of Western countries, you can see that we did at a time have a much more mercantilist approach to our economies. And it was precisely because that led to distortions and that led to an unequal income distribution and that led to uh, uh, that actually undermined our economic development in the long term, the advocates of free trade suggested moving away from it. So the West, I think, has a more mature approach to coordination now in some pockets than China has. You're on mute, Stella. Sorry about that. So I'm posing this question to Team West now. It's a question from David. And he says that, um, have we considered that in China, there's a greater motivation by the citizenry for their country's success and that you don't have that in the West? So Team West, what do you have to say to that? Anyone on Team West? Next, please. I'm thinking. Not, not, not Team China, you. No, sorry, you. This is for the other team. I'm <laughs> sorry. You can say something later on. <laughs> I think we're, we're just, uh, we're, we're trying to keep up the questions in the box. Could you just repeat the question you wanted to answer, please? Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Stella, you're on mute. Sorry, Martin. Sorry, Team West. The question is from David and he says, have we discussed the fact that the Chinese people are more motivated for their country's success than the West? Do you agree with that, Team West? And what do you think? That the citizens of the West are not as motivated for their country's success? No, no responses. From I think we will have to, we might have to maybe have a better understanding of what kind of motivation that um, they're talking about, because okay. yes, we, we can't just assume or we cannot, we cannot answer this question without really having an understanding of what kind of motivation they're talking about. What level of motivation do we see from China, from the West, low income countries? What does that mean, um, really? I think, yeah, we need a better understanding of the motivation. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, low income countries' biggest problem is about, okay, we've taken that question. There's another question here from Rachel Dixon. Um, Team West, you raised China's record on human rights. Do you think that the country should aspire to the West's record? Team West. Uh. Can I answer it? Yes, so, please. Yeah, I think that, yes, uh, they should aspire to be more like West. And yes, we do admit that the West also have a problems like, you know, the wind rush and also how the US, you know, deporting uh, the so-called illegal immigrants uh, under Trump administration. But we believe that uh, exactly why we know, uh, you know, there's a, you know, a ruckus about this. Like, it's because like there is a free press and also like how people like, you know, can scrutinize government anytime, anywhere they want. While in China, we don't exactly know what happened, for example, uh, in Tibet or in Xinjiang, because like uh, the Chinese government tried to cover up uh, uh, the human rights abuse that probably happens there. So okay. we believe that uh, low income should aspire to be more like West, because if there is a, you know, uh, any uh, abuses like in the working conditions or like in the environment, then uh, the government can be pressured by the society to actually, you know, clean up the mess and, you know, uh, redo okay. the policies or do any corrections uh, okay. uh, at if it's Thank you, Irfan. Team China, there's a question here from Samira. If developing countries follow China's example, the consequences for the global environment would be disastrous, and this would worse affect lower income countries. Aren't there far more hopeful examples and innovation coming from the West? Is that you wanting to respond, Ayushi? Yes. Right, please go ahead. You know, I, I think there is this general perception because I was looking at other uh, chats in the chat box that we are asking the lower income developing countries to copy China. We are not asking them to copy China. Authoritarianism, appalling. Don't copy that. Their response to environment crisis, appalling. Don't uh, copy that. Other issues as well. I mean, gender could be one, yes. 
my my take here is that we don't need to copy china at all you know that would be that would be a very foolish thing to do we need to be in a position we need to open our eyes out to china you know we are just so stuck up with this learning everything from the west that we need to look at china for the good things they've done as well as the mistakes they've made Sure. and that is why i make my stand i mean there's another question by ketki i think a part of my response would answer that we are not saying that economic rights are more important than social or political rights certainly not they never will be mm. but that's not our stand we are just saying okay. that if we look at china we can find probably more creative solutions to the problems okay. not that we have to copy them thank you so here's a question for both teams from linda in seeking to emulate either china or the west how should low income countries think about the respective respective model in terms of population demographics in terms of age and gender what lessons can they take from their respective countries in this regard this is a question for all panelists so please feel free to jump in linda's question i believe the panelists can see the question as well or do you need me to repeat it um Uncle, uh, I don't actually understand the question. She's asking, in seeking to emulate either China or the West, how should the low-income countries think about the respective model in terms of population demographics? What lessons can they take from their respective countries in this regard? I still don't understand it. Sorry, okay. I'm not sure if, if Linda is on the chat. Maybe she can clarify. Uh, can and can I answer? Try to answer Linda's questions. Okay. Yes, I think that uh, what should low countries should do is that you know they should you know uh, try try to adopt West model by try to you know uh, finding out what the best you know population uh, populations policies that uh, that. That fits with their country. Obviously, if we are trying to emulate China with their one China's policy, it will be like disastrous. And with like you know the gender ratio and how like that's led to you know selective abortion and selective birth. In which like the populations of male in China is bad, it's like bigger than the population of women in China. So that there's a uh, uh, millions of Chinese men who cannot marry because they don't you know they don't have a, a gender balance there. So I think mm -hmm. that that's exactly why uh, the low income countries should not try to emulate. A China example and let them, you know, do uh, demographic policies that might fit them, and we can learn and from the West because we have like various models that you can copy to. Thank you, Efren. There are quite um, a couple of other really interesting questions in the chat. Uh, I believe the panelists have sight of these questions, and um, we'll probably need to go into the closing session and, if it's possible, to respond to any of these. Um, in closing. And so I'd like to invite the team, the, the speaker from Team China to close um, the argument for that team. You have five minutes. Thank you, Stella. I'm not sure whether I can do this in five minutes. Try. Anyways, I'll try. <laughs> so I really wonder what is left for me to conclude after my team stand about the facts about China in the context of developing countries and low income countries. Because you see, as an Indian, and I hate to say this, but I grew up with a lot of preconceived notions about a lot of things, and China was one of them. And believe me, not all that I thought about the country was good until, of course, I came to IDS and I met Chinese students. I'm living with one, and most importantly, started working on this topic. And believe me, if I can be convinced that there is a lot to learn from China, you should be, because I mean, let's give them a fair chance now. You know, it's high time. Though I do believe, I mean, once I walk out of this debate, my right-wing family is going to disown me. So that's a little thing that I'm bothered about. Anyways, China has begun opening to the world and we now have a deeper understanding of its systems and setups. And we have spent years and years trying to adapt to the Western assembly line system and have already absorbed many of their ways and ideologies. But as I stand here, my intention is not to put the Western ideologies down or to prove that they have failed to work. But it is my quest as a student in IDS to search for creative solutions to problems that low-income countries are dealing with, more permutations and combinations to experiment with. And when I talk about experimentation, and I think China has developed that system of experimentations, and they have developed other institutions as well 
which support such systems of experimentations. And they're not, they always don't make sense globally, but they have proven to be highly effective. Also, almost everyone ever since I have come to IDS, they've expressed the need for stronger institutions and inclusive policies to expedite their development process. And when I think about what new can these countries learn regarding such policies and institutions, I somehow think of China. Experimentation and flexibility remains a key characteristic of this Chinese ways of policy making, and it has become necessary for low income countries to adapt to dynamic environments. I see these two uh, characteristics as in flexibility and adaptability as a shock absorber for these developing countries, and that is the need of the hour. You see, democracies like India are moving towards rapid privatization, and many intellectuals fear that the private sector very soon, they will overtake the power held by the institutions. If they do not strengthen and turn into more community centric and market centric. Two to three big business houses in India are planning to take over the financial sector and this type of crony capitalism might put India at the risk of becoming a victim of a politics with vested interest. I use this example because I have seen the, the, the scene, you know, it's changed in front of my eyes. It, it was my industry and I get goosebumps when I think about what the future holds for India. And this is where China has something to teach us. I mean, privatization and capitalism are uh, two distinct features of the Chinese economy. However, they are well under the control of the Chinese governance framework. Moreover, in all these years of being under various regimes, then being colonized for hundreds of years by the West, and then again being controlled by the West in the name of grants and aids, it's high time the developing countries start looking for alternatives and remove the Western horse binders to see some light from the land where theoretically the sun does rise before them. Also, we are not saying that, uh, and I reiterate, I've said that enough times that China is perfect. No country is and none can ever be. But we are not asking developing countries to copy China. We just wish to convince the house that the world has already learned a lot from the Western world and it's time we learn something new. And hence I can say that turning their heads towards China can be more rewarding for these countries in the present scenario. You see, the world has changed this year and it might take a while before we see it the way we've been used to seeing it. The Western countries have after years of exploitation of these countries, they are proposing to cut back on their grants and aids because they are debt laden. So what do we do now? I mean, we wait for them to become prosperous again, which might be at the cost of pushing us further into poverty. Or should we take the reins in our hands to make better use of this situation? You see, I, I, I always say this, the change, you know, it's a very painful process. I think of that caterpillar and butterfly example, but it is equally important for survival. We need new ways of looking at a situation and dealing with it. If we are still stuck with the solutions we have been using since the 18th century, how do we plan to adapt to the dynamic political environments of today? Our governments need to work smarter and we need, need to look at China both for its accomplishments as well as its failures. I said that while answering one of the questions and compromising on environment is one, you know, for economic growth. But there are endogenous factors that China has, which we can use to make our future better, which is innovation, experiment, better institutions. COVID-19 has emerged as a novel scenario for this generation and the repercussions have been unprecedented. We need novel solutions and new combinations of utilizing the state market and community. And maybe we have something new to learn from China if we open our eyes towards it. I'll end it now, but I, I genuinely feel I see hope in the Chinese model. And I could, it could okay. teach us something new to build solid institutions that reinstate the positivity that can be brought within low income countries through their okay. democracy. A deep penetrating capable system of bureaucracy, a private sector which is productive and less exploited. Thank you, Ayushi. Thank you. Five minutes are up, I'm sorry. It's not an issue. <laughs> Thank I you. I have to say just one line if you can allow me, Stella. Pardon? I need to say just one line. One line, are you? One line, I promise. One very short one, quickly. Okay. You see, it's time that the white man turns away its gaze and removes the burden of his shoulders that he has been carrying for centuries altogether. And now I rest. Okay, my time. that's two lines now. <laughs> <laughs> I use that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right then, Team West, five minutes to close your argument. Okay, sorry, I uh, my videos is not working for some reason. So yeah, I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. Judges and ladies and gentlemen, 
So what the team was are going to say is that we're going to, I'm going to explain to you why that you should go with us and support uh, us in this motions, right? So before that, before uh, I move to my explanation on why we should support us, let us clarify on what uh, West models, right? Because like, I think that the China team uh, are, did not really get what are we trying to say, right? So in our case, we are clearly saying that Western model, it doesn't mean that you only like think about the US or you cannot think about like, you know, the uh, neoliberal financialized and, you know, uh, Washington consensus type, right? Because we, what we offer to you is that we have like a varieties of Western model. We have like a Western, we have also a Western countries that, re, uh, that really pro equality, just like in the Scandinavian countries, which have like a higher tax. And also we also have like a, a you know economic coordinated model like what happened in Germany where like private and also state sectors are you know uh, uh, try to working out together to find uh, you know the perfect development model right so we think that what low income countries can pick from a lot of examples that we provide and not just like one uh, you know state guidance development model that uh, team china trying to offer to you so basically in this debate, we have like, uh, you know, the biggest contention in this debate is like which kind of model that low income countries should aspire to. And we say that low income countries should try to aspire like West. Why would they, Why did we say so? Because we think that number one, we have been trying to uh, explain to you that we have like a various model of development that, uh, that the low income country can aspire to. Second, we believe that if you are trying to you know, emulate West, we believe that we have like a more gender sensitive policy and also a policy that you know try to tackling down the economic inequality because uh, that's what the West uh, aspire to. And also we think that this kind of uh, you know uh, gender sensitive and inequality model, you know uh, less inequality model will uh, will be there because we offer the people a chance to express themselves so that they can openly criticizing uh, you know any development policies that they think did not you know support uh, gender equality or did not support equality so that's what the west are trying to say right so let's take uh, uh, their case right because basically china and team china uh, problem is that they never clearly explain to you what unique about a china development that low income countries should uh, copy right okay so basically if uh, they saying that number one uh, they, we should learn about how China can have a long-term policy and intelligence. We're saying that, no, that this is not mutually exclusive to China because how the West could also do this. Why do we say so? Because like uh, in the West, we, we've seen and how Norway managed their, you know, uh, uh, oil, uh, you know, the money from natural resources in a sovereign wealth, right? But even if uh, they think that, uh, we think that the politicians in the West, because of democracy, they're going to think long-term or otherwise they're going to be kicked out by the voters in the election, right? Also, they're saying about the stability experiment. We think that it's better in the West because they know the experiment can be criticized and scrutinized by the people. Unlike in China, for example, on how like one child policy become disastrous because there's been a decades of like, you know, expert trying to warn the Chinese government that this policy is disastrous, but they like, you know, uh, slow to adapt because there is no uh, political pressure coming from uh, because of the po political censorship. So we're saying that this is not going to happen. And also they're saying that the guided model is going to work, but then again, the guided model school only works if and only if uh, we let people to have a say and criticizing the government. This is something that China doesn't have, right? So basically, the whole team China argument is not mutual exclusive. That we can also have the benefit of China policy, like uh, you know, uh, meritocracy, long-term policy, and intelligence, because we can hire experts. The government can hire experts, and moreover, the people can criticize if these experts are going out in line or like uh, did not uh, cater to what people demands. So, uh, so that's basically what we want to say, and we also offer you more alternative of model of development that low income model aspire. And also, their case is that really unique to China because and not all countries can emulate that because not not all people have one billion people like in China or also uh, and also. There are very specific China case and like country like Timor Leste, for example, cannot emulate China because they don't have a population or market size as big as China. For so for all those reasons, we believe that low income countries should aspire to be more like West, and we should support our case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irfan. Thank you especially for keeping the time. And on that note, we've come to the end of the first debate. A very big thank you to all panelists for their thoughtful, passionate. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thoughtful, passionate arguments on this issue. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps we'd just like to take um, five minutes to hear from you panelists on, you know, what, what, what challenges and 
lessons that you drew from this experience? Any of the panelists? No challenges, no lessons learned? I, I, I learned one. Okay. Uh, uh, but coming from India and we share this really risky border with China. So I had been brain trained into it that, you know, like, China's enemy in this and that, but I, I don't think so. I mean, uh -huh. yeah, uh, call me, uh, there's too much to learn from. It's all, it's not all negative. Thank you. Thank That's you. That's what I've learned. Yes, Mick. Yeah, uh, Stella, I think my lesson is the same. I think the debate illustrated how incredibly difficult it is to have a discussion about what you might learn from China without getting into this ding dong about what is bad about China and you know, is it better or something. And that, that reflects a long period of Cold War and ideological battle. And I think we in the West are really have a real problem with this. Um, and I think it's really difficult to liberate our minds from that kind of conflict and say, well, you know, it's a country. Um, does it have some good stuff we can learn from? We, we find it really hard just to ask that simple question, I think. Thank you, Mick. Indeed. Yes, I, Yvonne. I okay. Yes, um, I think I, I had a really good time preparing for this essay, partially because uh, Mushin is my flatmate and I think we are going to continue the debate in the kitchen because I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what to expect preparing for the debate. I, I've heard so many things about China and even doing my research, I saw like a whole blog post on misconceptions about China. So at a point I felt like, okay, am I going to sway to the China, um, to join the China team? But also I realized that the thing is low income countries have really come a long way and have experimented with a lot of development models. And so it's good to, to really see which aspects of it work and which ones don't work and just to also learn from the other team. So it's been a great exercise for me. Thank you. Martin, you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about the counterpoint to what Mick said, which I think is that um, uh, because we're so aware of all of the negatives of the West's uh, relations with low income countries and all of the uh, um, all of the impacts of colonialism and now neo-colonialism and the Washington consensus, it's actually um, it's actually quite refreshing to try. It was actually quite refreshing to try and think positively a little bit about that side of things. So I think I think there's kind of a counterpoint to what Mick said, which is that 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 actually, yeah, we we need to think critically about what it is that we can embrace. Uh, those of us thinking coming from Western countries about our own countries. Yeah. Interesting. I Do think, you have any final thoughts from the panelists? For me, for me I think it, it is truly important, interesting to attend this debate since so many people, they have their stereotype about, about China, authoritarianism, or no, no human right in China. I think IDS as a member, as a student of IDS, we are, we are leading to the decolonization. Right. If we talk about learning something, of course, we can learn something from each country, from all over the world. We can learn something. China have, have something to doing badly or have something doing good. We need to, you know, respect them and see them equally. Even they do doing good, we have to keep talking, keep, keep criticizing about them. And when they have something doing very good, we also need to learn them, I think. So this is the most interesting point for me. Since I talk to with so many people, they are they are talking with the stereotype about China. Sometimes I feel it is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, you. Thank you. Um, what, we have one minute for this left. Anyone else? Any panelists who haven't spoken? Erfan, do you have something to say on this? Uh, well, I think like um, this is so interesting because uh, like I thought that. I, can, I learn as well, and I like uh, present, you know, also learn, uh, learn about China and try, I try to avoid, you know, stereotypes that being used in this, uh, when they talking about China. And yeah, I think like, it's very refreshing to know, like, there's another, like, we should like, uh, listen more to what, like, uh, the local perspective or, uh, or the Chinese perspective. And I'm glad that we have like, uh, you know, uh, you that actually from coming from China so that we can learn uh, firsthand, like, uh, you know, experiences and also like lessons that we can learn from China. So, yeah. Okay, all right then. So thank you very much to all the panelists. You did, you did really well and brought some really interesting things to the table. And at this juncture, we will pause for five minutes before we move to the next uh, debate session. Thank you everyone, thank you audience.
Hello everyone. My name is Stella Odiase and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second session. And the motion before this house is, this house believes that social movements should prioritize unruly politics over political actions traditionally recognized as legitimate. And by way of a context, um, we just like to put, place this on the table that traditionally people in power define what is considered as legitimate political action. In contrast, unruly politics is about people choosing to take part in politics on their own terms through disruptive actions that challenge traditional definitions of politics. Gandhi's hunger strike to protest caste division in India and Buzazi's self-immolation in the Arab Spring were acts of unruly politics of their own times. Contemporary examples are environmentalist organization XR that uses nonviolent civil disobedience, the organization of protests in Hong Kong using apps such as Pokemon Go, and the glitter revolution in Mexico, which uses violence against infrastructure to protest gender-based violence. And we have a three-member team to argue in favor on, of unruly politics. We have Rocio Gonzalez, who's studying for her master's in globalization, business, and development at IDS. She's an economist who, before her foray into IDS, worked in gender and rural development in the Gambia, Tanzania, and India. We have Robin Cooper, who's also in the master's in globalization, business, and development class, who's worked in rural development in the sugar industry for six years, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. And Vanessa Dubison, who's here with us at IBS, pursuing her master's in development studies, who's worked in INGOs in marketing and comms, and also has experience working at rural schools in Senegal. And on the team political action side, we have Bapa Singh, who's studying for his master's in development studies. He's a humanitarian aid and disaster relief expert and has worked in several countries. Nikki Mendu, studying for her master's in development studies. Before that, she worked as a junior storyteller in marketing for the Make a Difference Leadership Foundation. Last, but definitely not the least, Samira Bello, who's also part of the master's in globalization class at IDS and prior to that worked as a commercial analyst for an agricultural technology organization called Commercial Analyst for Thrive Agriculture. So welcome panelists, and I'd like to invite for the first five minutes, Team Unruly Politics. Can we have your first speaker up for the first five minutes, please? Thank you. Thanks, Stella. And thanks to IDS for inviting us to discuss this important topic today. The motion that this house defends is that social movements should prioritize and rule politics over political actions traditionally re recognized as legitimate. I, I always remember this joke that I heard when I first got to Brighton. How do you know that someone's gay? Because they're gonna tell you in the first five minutes. But well, um, I'm, I'm bisexual. And as open as I wanna be about it, um, letting you know about it is making me shrink inside in fear right now because there's a lot of people there and why i mean well it's because i have lived for four years in places where the lgbt movement has not progressed as much as here and my life my freedom my physical well-being depended on me keeping quiet and that was four years i mean imagine a lifetime but um generation after generation in different part different parts of the world social movements have pushed the boundaries for change through unruly political actions such as protest, music, art, or just speaking up when we were not supposed to, changing society's written and unwritten norms. So today we argue that unruly politics should be prioritized by social movements because of two key points. They are the most effective way to elicit a response and change power structures, and because the power structures are exclusionary themselves, so the traditional means that they legitimate are and really politics is often the only way for marginalized groups to have a voice. Looking at our first argument, and really memes are effective in eliciting a response. What does this mean? We argue that done correctly, they capture the attention and the interest of the broader population as well as the elite. 
they create an urgency and ensure that change may actually be in the interest of those in power. The loudness, the rudeness, the disruptiveness of unruly politics affects the established order. It does so in a way that those in power who had not been reacting to traditionally legitimized political actions, such as lobbying, voting, contacting your representative, they suddenly have more to lose from letting the disruption continue than if they react and try to bring back some order, any order, which gives the opportunity for change to happen. Social movements being unruly get more listened to than those staying under than their traditionally legitimized means. When Colin Kaepernick to, uh, took a knee in the American National Football League in protest for police brutality, he was being unruly. He disrupted and politicized the established order of a sports game. He politicized the audience immediately. The rapid end of Kaepernick's career then was a response to his unruliness, and this served as a trigger for thousands of people to join the Black Lives Matter social movement. This aligns with other social movements in history, which peacefully but quietly, but quickly, have achieved to get the attention of society, like Gandhi's salt march against colonial rule in India or the bus boycotts in the 1960s in America for the civil rights movement. The urgency, it means that unruly politics need to be prioritized over traditional means because they are a catalyzer for every other change that may arrive later through these own traditional means. But then let's go to our second argument, how in many cases, unruly means are the only available option for those that require the urgent change. This is because the, of the inherently exclusionary and inefficient and insufficient nature of traditionally legitimized mechanisms. Those in power, it's very easy, those in power are the elites and they provide the rules by which citizens live, which throughout history have led to marginalizing certain communities. And we have seen how boundaries of these rules have been pushed and rights have been gained, but this progress is not a given. It has been a struggle of the social movements pushing the status quo. Traditionally legitimate actions are reserved for the privileged and are often attached to long bureaucratic processes that leave those with limited time, money or education, most importantly, out. And informal rules also leave, informal norms leave people out as well, like religion, like culture. They reinforce the formal rules and anyone who does not fit within the oppressive dominant narratives like racism or homophobia, they're at the risk of behaving unruly just by claiming their own position in society. A democratic mechanism, um, formal democratic mechanism such as voting, was off limits for the African-American people in the United States some time ago. The Jim Crow laws, as you well know, placed exclusionary requirements to vote. And it was the unruly politics of the civil rights movement that forced this law to be overturned by the Voting Rights, rights Act. Or until recently, in Tanzania until 2017, it was illegal to question official statistics. Or you know about Saudi Arabia, there was no woman in power to push for the right of women to drive and it had to be achieved by women's creative unruliness. So these examples demonstrate the need for an alternative space, figuratively and literally, by which to make voices heard, where traditional mechanisms are rigid and slow to change, and really politics opens up an opportunity for the oppressed to express themselves. Okay. Be it at a... Go on, you have like 30 seconds. Oh. Be it at a march with a million people or just by being themselves under the harsh light of society. With these two assertions, this house demonstrates that the prioritization of unruly politics is essential for social movements. Thank you, Rocio, excellently said. Sorry, I had to interrupt you there. All right then, can we have a um, speaker from Team Traditional Political Action then to open? Good evening. Um, just checking that my mic is on, you can all hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, good evening to the panel and all the guests tuning in. It is my greatest pleasure to open and present my teammates' opposition against the motion that social movements should prioritize unruly politics over political actions traditionally recognized as legitimate due to the ensuing adverse effects such as businesses and lives being lost in violent clashes, countries being destabilized, unstructured movements that lead to mixed messaging and hate crime, unfocused leadership, which can lead people astray and several more, which my teammates are later gonna expand on. For the purposes of this debate, I'm gonna start off by defining five essential points. 
First of all, I know you touched on it, Stella, thank you very much, but uh, to elaborate on really politics, according to Maurice Tadros um, at IDS, um, is defined as the marginal space through which citizens engage politically outside the conventional realms of state and civil society. Second point, political action recognized traditionally as legitimate is described as formal politics as institutional politics, i.e. the state and its associated institutions. Thank you to Tessa Lewin. Third point, social movements. Um, we are taking the 2009 definition from the paper Clashing Activisms that says movements are that are pushing for political change, specifically where collective identities and shared culture are emphasized and equal rights for marginalized and non-conforming individuals traditionally recognized legitimate political action. Based on this definition, it means that social movements should be legitimate rather than unruly. Um, my fourth definition is civil disobedience which is defined as always involving breaking the law or breaking certain social norms. Um, according to Hannah Arendt, it is nonviolent and always in public. And finally, and uh, one of the important ones I wanna draw out is that of the social contract. Um, a social contract is an agreement that people enter into to make their lives better. And in doing so, we trade in some freedom. Based on this, we argue that a social contract is necessary for society to function cohesively. Looking back to the philosopher Socrates, whom today is recognized as one of the early thinkers of the rule of law, he was sentenced to death after being accused of corrupting the young minds. Even though he could have tried to flee, he didn't because he argued that he'd spent his whole life living under and benefiting from the rule of law. And so he couldn't back out now, otherwise it, he would be breaking his social contract with the state. So why does the law matter? Well, the limitations of not having a social contract were further reiterated by Hobbes' idea of the state of nature. In a world where there are no rules, everyone is free, but we have no security. So for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement that happened earlier this year, I understand that the movement was necessary, but when evening curfews were imposed um, for the safety and health of people, people defied and riots broke out in more than US cities um, and shops were looted and burned, violence became rampant and there were some major service delivery impacts to the point where even the Black Lives Matter movement, didn't, they were not condoning this. Here we reinforce the argument for the need for a social contract to save everyone from a state of chaos that results when there are no rules. You might ask, why does it matter that we follow the law? Well, think about it like this. Friends of the world were to stage a sit-in every time they felt robbed by the system. If the person behind you was stuck of sitting in traffic, so decided to just drive on the other side of the road, if people decided to take justice into their own hands all the time, you would then have the emergence of movements like hashtag COVID-19 is a hoax, thanks America, and uh, social other social movements and um, drawing on specifically America now, um, like not wearing protesting against masks amidst others. There can be social instability if we don't follow the rules whenever they're not convenient for us. Following the rules of legitimate political action leads us to drink safe, clean water, to drive on safe roads, have access to hospitals and schools, and to lessen mortality, injury, forced displacement caused by civil unrest. Ultimately, the law is there to protect us. And for centuries, we have created the system by which we agree to live under through our social contract. It is when it becomes violent, unlawful, and unsafe that it becomes unruly. We don't say move, social movements or movements in general cannot progress. Freedom of speech is a right for all of us. Okay. What we propose instead is the argument for legal rather than unruly politics traditionally recognized as legitimate for social movements. Okay. Um, is my time up completely? <laughs> Yes, it is actually. I'm okay, sorry. cool. That's yes, all right. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure to... you'll have some time later on. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite the second speaker from the against, the team against. 
the second speaker. Please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, is my is my time starting now? Okay, thank you, Nikki, for your fantastic speech. What is sure by now has convinced all of us. Unruly politics is very problematic because there is no central leadership, something that consequently impacts accountability hierarchy. There are easy circulation of fake news, less sustainability, and how to measure the long-term gain with multiple negative impacts. Traditional politics is very useful because we have this type of organization, accountability, and long-term implementable structural change. Why do we say this? Look, in traditional ways of doing politics, we have organizing rules. These institutions work in more hierarchical and lawful ways in which they tend to ensure social movement for political change through lobbying, campaigns, and petitions, amongst others. There are so many legitimate social movements worldwide based on individual countries, laws, and regulation. Under the Charity Commission for England and Wales, any charity can become involved in campaigning, which has no limits. And political activity the funder contributes to or supports its charitable purposes. Campaigning here refers to awareness raising and efforts to educate or involve the public by mobilizing their support on a particular issue, ensuring that existing laws are observed or influencing or changing public attitudes. Example of campaigning might include a human rights charity calling on the government to observe certain fundamental human rights. The political activity can be a, to change the law if it supports their charitable purposes. It can also, for, also be aimed at securing or opposing any change in the law or the central government's policy or decision. Local authorities or other public bodies, whether in England or abroad, it also includes activity to preserve an existing piece of legislation where a charity opposes it being rep repelled or amended. Political activity might include seeking to influence political parties or independent candidates, decision makers, politicians, or public servants on the charity position in various ways to support the desired change and respond to consultations carried at political parties. Also, according to section 5, 01c3 of the United States FIRS policy. Nonprofits can engage in some lobbying without losing their tax exempt. Nonprofits can engage in lobbying anytime it attempts to persuade members of the legislative body to propose, support, oppose, amend, or repel legislation. Large international organizations such as Amnesty International and One.org have been involved in several global social movements without any negative consequences. They have improved amended laws and impact countries socially through campaigns, lobbying and petitions. So we can say that certain types of protests are available that are recognized as politically legitimate. We are not against the idea of people organizing and coming together. What we are against is people breaking the law. We are in favor of legal protesting campaigning, lobbying, and petitioning using established charities, INGOs, NGOs, so that people, even without access, resources, and political power can come together and mobilize for social causes. This is important so that multiple voices are not lost, our part is clear, and people can be held accountable for mistakes missed, made. Hence, we do not have the issues that unruly politics does. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Samira. And all with one minute to spare. Well done. Right. Team Unruly Politics, team in favor. Can we have your second speaker, please? Thank you. Hi there, sir. That's me. Um, OK, so I would like to just continue the uh, wonderful arguments put forward by Rossio and also acknowledge those from um, the team opposing the motion. I want to start to just reiterate a little bit behind the definition that we use and unruly means as drawing their power from transgressing traditional rules, but at the same time upholding others, which may not be legally sanctioned, but which do have legitimacy. They are deeply rooted in people's own understanding of what is right and what is just. Unru unruly means are necessary because they're the only space for the marginalized, 
to make it known that the social contract contract that they are adhering to has been broken elsewhere in the system, which I'll come to more later. But first up, I'm going to tackle the elephant in the room, violence. Unruly methods encompass a wide variety of actions, the vast majority of which are in fact non-violent. Um, a huge study done between 1900 and 2006 of um, all resistance movements actually showed that amongst the largest protests, so the ones that have, I guess, the most impact, 80% of those were completely non-violent and their, their rules around violence and non-violence were very strict, including knock-on effects beyond just those that were protesting themselves. Unruliness can evolve in, in many different ways. That's the beauty of it. It's creative, it's adaptable, something that the legitimate means are not. Art, music, literature are all forms of unruly mechanisms. They, they make people uncomfortable. They're not at any point causing violence um, or other negative, I guess, impacts other than making people question their existing belief systems. Uh, you can look at whole genres. You've got blues, you've got grime, you've got the struggle music in South Africa. These are all incredibly effective. Um, and they, and actually just to Samira's point there, often these things are well organized with inspiring leaders. Martin Luther King, a, a big proponent of nonviolence was actually seen as a terrorist in his time. Let's not forget that. Then moving to the ones that are violent because we cannot ignore the fact that some, you know, some unruly um, means do lead to violence. But I want to ask everybody listening this question, why? What leads to such action? Social movements are born out of oppression, of grievance and a sense of social injustice. Is this enough to warrant violence? Even in a retaliation to an oppressive government that may have been responsible for killing and oppressing thousands? I'm not sure that that's something that we can ever answer fully outright, but one thing that we have done is looked into some riots that um, maybe have gone in, have had some negative effects. You look at food riots, for example, all the way back to Moscow in 1648 um, against government imposition of a universal salt tax to those in Venezuela more recently. People only riot, people only get angry when they are being oppressed, when their own lives are at risk because of not having access to basic things such as food. I want to leave that point there for us to pick up perhaps some more later. Next, the point of social cohesion. As I stated in my kind of earlier definition, um, around social cohesion and the social contract, unruliness is only actually necessary because the social contract has been broken elsewhere in the system. The people that are creating these rules, the people that have decided what is and isn't legitimate, are the ones that have actually broken the social contract in the first place. I think if we look um, first, perhaps to the West as an example where there are many perhaps aspirational laws, um, the rule of law in both the UK and in the US. And I'm just going to pick a couple of those things. You've got the law. Um, one, one element of this is that the law of the land should be applied equally to all. Now, if we look at the judicial system and you look at every single point along that process, there are extensive studies that show how discriminatory these processes are for black and minority groups at every single point, um, be that being subject to more searches, more arrests, more unfortunate incidents, prosecutions, harder verdicts, that is not part of a social contract and they need a way of making their voice heard. Is that time? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll get on to more later, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Robin, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, well done, thank you very much. And we have some time for each of you, the panelists, to sort of like pick up where Stella cut you, cut you short. Um, we're going into the open debate now. It's 10 minutes for um, panelists from either side uh, to make their arguments. So, Robin, would you like to continue or would someone else like to? Hi. I, uh... I can go. Okay. Hi, Barbara. Right. So, uh, yeah, one minute, Barbara. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rosio, if I'm saying that correctly, this is a question directed to you. Um, so you mentioned the Saudi Arabia protests. Um, so allowing women to drive, I think that's what you were referring to. 
Um, but it's actually been proven the re reason why Saudi Arabia allowed women to drive was to promote tourism because they couldn't actually rely on solely on their um, oil. And so they had to force um, other sources of income. And there's still women in prison who actually protested. Um, so what is the benefit? Why, you know, I agree with the movement in theory, um, and everything. I agree with women allowing to drive. But when it became unruly, that's when they were got arrested and it didn't actually lead anywhere. Thanks a lot yeah. for raising this topic, actually, um, because, yeah, OK, it's been approved to promote tourism. But this is one of our points that we didn't have time to elaborate on is how unruly means are like this rudeness, this this loudness that they provoke. It's international, especially these days. So sometimes your government is not going to listen to you being unruly, but everybody else is. That's the audience that's maybe going to force the government to implement the measures that you're asking for. So the fact that it was affecting tourism is completely related to those women that were being unruly, posting videos in YouTube, be going to prison and the diaspora pushing for this. Yeah, I have a question too, based on what Robin said, um, based on the speech of Rob, what Robin said, um, Robin said that ruling politics is, um, brings about art and drama. I want to reply that NGOs are the ones that actually do the art and drama more than unruly politics. They are amazing at that. And then my second question, my question to you is, you said people only riot when they are oppressed and that's a lie because the recent, um, NSAS protest and uh, what's it called? Black, like, Black Lives Matters protest in the US and the NSAS protest in Nigeria it was not like that. Togs and people who actually wanted to steal for the stealing sake actually used that protest when people were this, to go and rob, to go and loot, to create crimes, to start shooting. And that was actually what brought about the lockdown in the US and what brought about the lockdown in Nigeria. So when you say that people only riot when they are oppressed, that's not true. People actually also riot when they see they miss an opportunity to do so. Not because they don't care about the protest or anything, but because it's an opportunity. Let's do it. Nobody will catch us. It will be blamed on exercise and it will be blamed on um, Black Lives Matters. And that was what actually happened. And that was why the government actually had to intervene. Thanks, Samira. I'd love to respond to that. So um, first up, I guess around this, uh, let's go on the thing of, of, of riots. I would look at that to say, who, where did the original movement come from? The people that were actually starting that movement were the oppressed ones that were looking for a space. D saying that is almost like the way that you would look at um, the whole conversation around, around rape culture. That's almost like telling the woman that she needs to be the one that watches what she wears because of the response of the man, not looking at the response of the man being the issue. In this scenario, I'm using an example of the, the man in the situation being the ones that are going out opportunistically and writing. The oppressed, it's not their responsibility of how other people respond. So that's the first thing. Um, I, I, I can't remember the first thing you said, Samira, you'll have to um, remind me about that. But one thing I'd like to pick up on is around lobbying. And, one thing that we want to discuss in this open bit is how so many legitimate mechanisms are off limits to, to the, the, the general people. 25 million pounds a year is spent by the elites on lobbying. So how do you go about actually interjecting there? Okay, I've just remembered the other thing. <laughs> okay, that's more than a minute. Yeah, so okay, thanks. Okay. Can I take the- Can, can I, I respond? So, sorry, can, I... can we have um, Vanessa then Barbara? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank the other side for proving our points. I mean, I don't know if they want to join our team here. Um, but the first thing, perhaps, uh, or Bapa, what you said was that, you know, um, in Saudi Arabia, um, they couldn't rely on oil over there. So they had to give women the rights to drive. Well, we're saying that women should have started with a social movement. If they had done that, maybe they would have got their rights a lot sooner. Um, the very fact that you're saying that traditional means are not even available for Saudi Arabian women, uh, Arabian women just completely proves our point. Okay. Um, and then, okay. Not a minute, I'm sorry. Okay. Final okay, point, thank you. Barbara. One minute, Barbara. Okay, okay. I'll be quick. Uh, just to respond to that, women in Saudi Arabia did protest and uh, um, not being able to drive. And so that, and that is why there's many women in prison 
seven um, because they protested. And also, Rosie, to go back to your thing, it, it's not, it affected tourism. It was because they were trying, the reason why they changed is because they wanted to promote more tourism. And that's why they allowed women to drive. It's not, it, it's actually been proven in there. It wasn't, you might have a slight, um, people will say it's because of the social movement, but most people would agree that it's because they just wanted to change their image. And it's the new king who came into power who actually made that change, not okay. because of the social movement. Thank yeah, you. can I say something? Thank you, Samira. I'm sorry, we have to end this session. Thank you. Very passionate, interesting debate. And I'm sure you'll get another chance towards the end to, to share with us what it was you wanted to say. We'd like to quickly proceed to the session where we take some feedback from our listeners and from the rest of the audience. So we have 15 minutes for that. Um, Ruben, I'm wondering if you could uh, kindly start off this session while we wait for people to type in their questions. Oh, there are lots of questions already. But Ruben, could you please open the session? Thank you. Yes, uh, my question to both teams would be to evaluate the costs against the benefits and to explain why the benefits outweigh the costs. So, uh, for example, for the team of unruly politics, the main harm that could be seen is the back the potential backlash by the elites that are the ones that are often legitimize and the potential harms to individuals within the system and, and the ones that are uh, in the social movement, right? So, and for the, the team of legitimate politics, um, the main harm would be time in a moment of urgency, right? The idea that we need urgent changes for individuals that are living in oppressed systems. So do a, 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 a cost analysis benefit in which you can say to us why the benefits outweigh the costs in your sides. Okay. Thank you, Ruben. Um, yeah, I think that's that's food for thought. Or would you like them to respond to that, or just to reflect on it? Sounds like no. To respond, to respond to that. To yeah. Respond. Okay. okay. Any thoughts can on I, that side, Robin? Can I do? Yeah. Robin, did you have your, yeah? Robin, then Vanessa. Robin. Okay, Vanessa and I are on the same team, so I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, I, I'd, I'd look at the U.S. history of the democratic system. Um, their democratic system worked incredibly well up until the 1960s, except for the fact that it was built on oppression of the black community. So I guess the trade off there is we could have kept the social cohesion um, and not had the polarization we see today. Um, or you have today where you've actually got civil rights for, for all people. So I guess that's how we would describe it. The, the benefit clearly far outweighs the cost um, of the oppression. I'll let can, uh, okay. Vanessa. Thank yeah, I'm going to I'm going to echo what Robin has said. I don't think, um, you know, um, Emmett Till's mother, who, who's, the, who's the mother of a young boy who was beaten to death. I don't think people who's, whose uh, families were swinging from trees. I don't think that they started to think, how how are we going to, um, you know, uh, get the backlash of the white community? It was kind of the same outcome at the end of the day. Um, and then secondly, um, there's a, I don't know if we can, perhaps there's a question in here from Cesar. I don't know if I can move to that or should I just respond to? Please go ahead. Go ahead, Vanessa. Um, Cesar has, sorry, Cesar mentioned something along the lines of why do unruly political social movements consider themselves as out of the system and still try so vehemently to be recognized by governments? Obviously there are movements that have brought down governments have changed it, have changed um, um, parties so that there is um, a much uh, better, fairer way um, of, um, uh, of being ruled. So it's, I mean, it's, there are various different types of social movements that have brought down governments, but then have also um, asked for laws as well. So that's my... Right. Can I add on um, to, to respond to Ruben's yeah. question? Please go ahead, Nikki. Um, okay, thanks. So I'll start off with some of the, the costs at first. So um, just you're at, like mentioning the time aspect. Um, so yes, maybe it takes a little bit longer, but it's also how effective it is because a lot of the um, uh, like the unruly politics it's it goes in no direction like what are the kind of goals how do you measure that because there's all these voices, but what are you going to achieve, um, which kind of goes 
ties into another one of the benefits of having a traditional politics because you have a centralized leadership so you can have accountability if there are things that go wrong. So you're talking earlier, Robin, about some of the leaders that, you know, they are, you know, command is not infallible, but you have that accountability and you can trace back and, and see. And it also allows people to, um, to, um, to participate um, in a system because I, if you look at um, unruly politics, it can also be oppressive in its own right in terms of some of the informal power structures that can emerge in the, these spaces that are created um, for individuals where people are intimidated and can, uh, into joining certain movements or, um, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, let me add to what um, Nikki just said based on our own point. Um, I want to say one of the cost benefits for us is that, for example, in unruly politics, it always we always see that apart from the the what other people have said, there is always a loss of life. There's loss of lives. People die through unruly politics when it becomes chaotic. Um, people, there's loss of properties. We've seen that a lot. There's huge loss of finance when it comes to unruly politics when they when chaos starts. And there's also people who spend time in prison loss of time for their own personal self. But in our, in our own politics, um, politics that is legitimate, you realize that there is accountability like what Nikki says. Accountability in the sense that everybody, when they are coming out, NGOs, uh, political organizations that are registered, when they, they are coming out, they are accountable for their movement. They are accountable for their citizens and they are accountable for what they say. And also what Nikki said, there's sustainability. The, the next generation of people in that same NGO carry that movement forward. There's always sustainability. And finally, you realize that, and finally you realize that it is okay. the same okay. political. Sorry, Samira, I need to <laughs> I'm so sorry, as fascinating as you sound, because <laughs> can I just ask this question from Erfan for the team on ruling politics? And the question is how, the disruptions can make you win the support from the conservatives whose support you need to create the progressive policies that you want. So team on ruling politics, any thoughts? Sorry, what did you say? I, I that's, so that's for us, for us to answer, right? Yes. Um, so I think one of the key things that we um, we would put forward is that it depends on the mechanism you use. Uh, I, I've drawn something that Samira said around NGOs. Um, NGOs can also take part in unruly politics. Um, that's that's not just because of who they are doesn't mean that they can't be unruly. Um, and it, it's how you go about doing it. So the most effective, um, as to our point we're saying unruly politics is effective, the most effective ones are the ones that actually get the attention and the support of the um, the rest of the population. So if you get three and a half percent of the population on board, you, you basically can't fail in your movement. Um, there is a lot of, I guess there are a lot of examples where that where that has happened. Um, it's it's not a case of being unruly turns away the, the the rest of the people. That isn't that isn't the intention necessarily of unruly mm -hmm. politics. I see. Can I answer to that? No, Samira. Just a minute. It's for the other team, Vanessa. Yeah. So um, just to answer Erfan's uh, question, in the nineteen seventies with the disability movement, um, they pretty much. Um, got their message heard by having you know by quadriplegics paraplegics deaf blind multiple disabled people um acting in unruly ways um you know protesting outside of um uh, a senator's house um sleeping in uh risking their lives being jailed and eventually this conservative government that you talk about had to by force concede and uh, sign legislation um, in order to protect the civil rights of mm -hmm. disabled people. So it's it can be done. Okay, so I'd like to pull you in. Um, maybe Samira can take this and add to what she wanted to say before. This is a question for the against team. And it says, hasn't it been proved by history that the powerful do not give up their power in order to improve social justice unless under intense pressure? Thank you. Thank you. That also boils down to my question and um, what I wanted to say before. Um, one, we, one thing we, we need to realize is when we say political 
organizations um, recognize as legitimate. And the example I gave of, for example, in the England and um, Wales, it says that any NGO can campaign and there is no limit to their campaign. So it's not about power, it's about how legitimate, how, what means of legitimacy are you using to campaign? It means that people, NGOs that have been for climate change, NGOs that, NGOs that have gone for human rights, NGOs that are for LGBTQ, all these NGOs have used their voices to campaign. We can see that one young one.org has used their voices to campaign. We can okay. see that um, Amnesty International. So we're saying that NGOs, which are legitimately recognized as um, um, political, can campaign and make sure social movements pass on okay i'm sorry i have to sorry we <laughs> we have to move to closing now this is so interesting and i see hands are up but maybe you can find a way to squeeze it into what time we have left and on that note i'd like to invite team on really politics to close and you have five minutes whoever's speaking Thank where you. do i start i don't i don't even know i mean the other team you start been... yeah Please start the the other the other team um i don't know they started off with talking about socrates not fleeing uh, this is a white man and we know that one me white men have privilege so of course he doesn't have to flee but if i was a black man with a police officer with his knee on my neck i might very well decide to flee um then we started talking about the social contract um which is fantastic um and great and wonderful um, however, um, I'm not sure who agreed to those rules because quite a number of people were stolen from Africa, brought over to the West, um, and then were forced to actually um, have to uh, sign that contract, and there was no contract that was signed. And since then, um, we have been struggling through social movements, using unruly politics for change. And this is exactly what we're talking about. I want to take, I want to talk to you about a story. So our opposing team have said that we should use traditional means. Um, and then they prove our point by saying that Saudi Arabia only changed the laws for women because it was in their interest. So what we're saying is social movements should challenge those types of structures. We're saying that un using unruly politics to change power structures at every level is the most effective. We're saying that unruly politics challenges existing power structures and it allows these um, social movements uh, to create their own space and use their own language to communicate with governments and to communicate with power structures that do not listen to them we heard about you know acting within the law so in tanzania uh, two men are not allowed to kiss that's them breaking the law um you know so are you saying that two men shouldn't kiss is that what you're saying we are, you guys, I think, have to decolonize your argument a little bit. Not everybody has the means to lobby. In the disability movement, the people who were lobbying and the reason why the disability, the disabled people had to fight was because the people who were lobbying were private businesses. They were um, education um, uh, schools. Um, and also there were other people with interest that didn't want to change the buildings to accommodate disabled people. And so the laws and regulations and uh, legislation was being held up. Um, and the only way that they could get heard was to sleep on the floor, despite not having blankets, food or anything. In fact, it was the unruly Black Panthers who came in and helped them in their movement. And still today, they continue to struggle. We had a young girl who was crawling up the stairs um, in, in America to demonstrate that she wanted her rights um, from the government because lobbying simply didn't work. Um, so you pretty much prove my point. People often have to think outside the box because they themselves are outside the box. And Cesar, who mentioned, what about those governments, you know, you know, um, why are they, why are people trying to act within, within governments? Sometimes they're bringing down governments. We had the Arab Spring. Um, so there are a number of uh, different movements um, who have a number of different needs, um, but who actually do get change, who do get a response, an immediate response from power and an immediate change. And in some time, and sometimes those unruly politics can last for years. Okay. Um, 
And yeah, that's my closing argument. <laughs> well done, Vanessa. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'd like to invite the team again to present their closing arguments, please. And you have five minutes starting now. Hey everyone, thanks for staying with us because I do know Liverpool's playing in the Champions League, so <laughs> I'll try to be quick. Um, but yeah, no, with Vanessa um, and with the, actually the other team, they raise a lot of good points. But our, our, our argument is that using legitimate practices and using the law to get to um, progress social movements, um, you know, personally, I don't think this should even be a debate. I think the debate should be is how can we use legitimate politic, uh, legitimate, legitimate political actions in, um, so that unruly politics doesn't need to exist. Because there's in many ways in law, we've created a society now and we've developed laws in so many ways that, you know, we can, there are ways we can change from within. Um, I, you know, I went to a protest on uh, Sunday in London, and it was supposed to be, uh, it's a peaceful protest, it was supposed to be a car protest. So it was supposed to be within the confinement of the new laws um, in terms of COVID. But a lot of people um, got out of their cars and then protested. And that's when it became unruly. unruly. And that's, you know, that is the problem, because when it became unruly, the, all the papers, you know, talked about, oh, it was a mass gathering, it, you know, it gave, um, so then it diverted their attention for what we went to actually do. If there was a central leader, if there was somebody who can actually speak on um, and say, look, remain in your cars, remain, you know, and we'll get our point across a lot further. And that's just what I'm trying to say. And the reason why we protested in London was because of the protests that are going on in India right now, um, where they're, they're doing peaceful protests in Delhi. And the reason is because, in, um, so India um, signed the Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which India ceded to on the 10th of April, 1979. This explicitly enshrines the right to peaceful assembly in, inter, um, in international human right law. So that's the reason why I went to the protest is to actually um, put pressure on our government here to say, hey, look, hold India accountable for the stuff that they have signed. Hold India accountable for the, lit, um, for the laws that they have made. So we're not, you know, there are many ways in which we can make social movements in a political way, such as in South Africa, um, Neri. Uh, so I'm just going to read this out. So he's a Tanzanian, Tanzanian president that believed in nonviolence, ideas from Gandhi, but through legitimate political action, he decolonized Pan America and ascended to presidency. Uh, under his rule, the country nationalized banks, healthcare, educations, which were expanded under his regime. And um, he ensured a stable state and, de and it was therefore decolonized. We're not saying social movements can't expand. We're just saying if you do it within the confinements of the law, they have a longer progression and they're more sustainable. And okay. so, yeah. Thank, well, you, my time. Time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> okay. Within time. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And on that note, um, we've actually come to the end of this very spirited extremely interesting debate. I could listen to you lot for the, for the rest of the night, actually. Well done, thank you um, to panelists from all sides. Um, I was wondering if you could perhaps, like the other team, the other panelists in the first debate did, share some reflections, um, challenges, reflections around the process now, not on really politics or traditional protest, right? The process and, and, and what you think. Who'd like to go for Not you, Baba, you just spoke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else like to get- Sorry, what did you say? I didn't get you. Yes, just sharing your reflections around the process. Not about the NSARS protest now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like I found it very challenging. Um, I joined the team last week and I don't, didn't know anything about unruly politics, to be honest. Um, so we, we didn't have a lot of time, but um, it was it was really um, 
it was really, I found it very challenging. But I enjoyed it today, funnily enough. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, um, same thing for me. I, I actually, when they gave us, truth be told, when they gave us the, what's it called, the topic, and I saw uh, we were opposing on really politics. In my mind, I was like, what? <laughs> because on a, on, a, on a normal day, I wouldn't oppose on really politics. <laughs> But when I started reading, sincerely, when I started reading, I started researching and saw that there were actually laws that you could use. And I started reading and researching. I was like, oh, now I think we would win. Because I was like, mm -mm, it's not so just like what the China team was saying. It's when you read and research that you realize that all the notions you have in your in your head is actually not true because it's what you see. And what you hear that you would, you know, this thing. Yeah, so. Thank yeah. you so, so much. Does anyone else want to share their thoughts? Nikki, you have something to say? You're looking it's very. Been, oh, it's been funny. Sure. Sorry, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Very lot of people here. It's been, it's been funny how we have spent over a week developing arguments and like trying to dismantle what does this mean? But why? But what is behind? But how? And like finding all the examples in history around the world and against and for, and now it's been so quick that we didn't really pull like a 10%. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even I'm read so that kind of statement. I'm so sorry, guys. But you know, part of it is also learning how to make the arguments within a particular time frame in a succinct manner and what to, what to focus on and what to leave at the bottom of the list. Yes, Baba, I see you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I agree with uh, Rosie. I think, you know, it's it was so difficult because we had so many points that we could have brought forward and to support the arguments, but within the time constraints. And just to reiterate what Samira said, I was for the other team when they gave us the motion as well, until, you know, like, there's so many ways that you can make change and use the law against, like, the people in power as well. And there's so many laws that, you know, we can do um, social movements in a legitimate way that I didn't really, uh, wasn't really aware of before like, the debate. Okay. Interesting. Any other reflections, Robin? Yeah, I'd love to just add. Yeah, I think, um, especially with the, with the opposing team, what you were saying, uh, going into it, it was almost easier because it was a motion that we, I think the three of us were supporting and would anyway. Um, but having to think for the other side definitely had the same things coming up. Um, for me, uh, as Vanessa said, you know, this has been quite last minute for the three of us, but we've like spent this whole week working closely together. And for me, it's just been so enjoyable because I didn't know Vanessa or Rocio very well before this, but now like, it's just, you know, it's just, I've just made two new friends through this process awesome. and I've learned so much. Um, I think it's been a good thing to do at the end of the term because it's, it's been a way of actually saying, oh yeah, I think I did something on that earlier this term. <laughs> So, thank you. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> Is there anyone? Did we leave anyone out? Can I add in one thing? Oh yes, please, Nikki. Oh, how could you forget? Um, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, I want to say thank you very much to everyone. Um, I yeah, kind of agree with what everyone has already mentioned in terms of. Um, I think I, I also just really. In Am I good? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. No. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Sure. Um, I was. Just, I really enjoyed like the process with um with my teammates because I think like sometimes from a personal standpoint I can think that you know disagreeing is like uh, like not a good thing like now we're like not friends but like we would have like arguments amongst ourselves like you're saying Robin like like countering ourselves and being like but why and like but you know and it was it was a lot of fun to get heated but also to just you know learn from it so that was good awesome. thank you very much thank you panelists you did great um james are you there would you like to to say a few words james is our communications guru yeah, hi. in ids and he's done a lot of the heavy lifting on this james You've also done a lot of work, Stella. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Just really, um, just as we're finishing up, I want to say a few thank yous to everyone. Um, to Linda and to Robert Chambers, um, they really helped us get the ball rolling on this. So Marcella and me, we had a call with them way back in the summer, and they really inspired us to um, get this debating series off the ground. So a big thank you to them. Um, I particularly want to thank um, one of the teams, uh, the one with Ruscio, Robin and Vanessa. You guys joined the debate last minute. We had a few dropouts. 
And, you know, you came in last minute and you've done a really fantastic job with less time than the other teams. So, uh, yeah, well done to you guys. Um, I really want to thank Ruben. You know, he's uh, you know absolutely brilliant with um, you know, the comments he made, the question uh, that he asked. And, of course, he's going to give you uh, feedback on everything that you've said. So, yeah, we look forward to that. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, most of all, to Marcella. Um, she's an alumni. You know, she studied at IDS. She, uh, without her, I don't think we could have got this process off the ground. Um, so an amazing thank you to her. Um, and also she's going to the World Championship, I believe, in debating uh, in January. So the best of luck to her. I know that all of IDS uh, is supporting you in that. Um, oh, and thank you, Stella, as well, for, uh, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you, James. I would like to hear a few last words from Linda, from Robert Chambers. I don't know if Peter Taylor is in the room, and I don't know if the IDS director, Professor Melissa Leach, is here. But let's start with, with Linda. Excellent. Okay, so, so Linda, are you there? No? I thought I saw a message from... Um, James, I don't know if Linda has permis permission to speak. Um, no, I do know. The oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> My it did something funny and then it gave me permission to speak. So um, I, I also, I just want to add you know, add my thanks to all of you, to the debating team. I, I thought it was amazing. I mean, you were eloquent, you were articulate, you were informed, you were passionate. Um, I heard stories, I heard facts, I heard references, I heard theory. Um, all of you were amazing. And I was overwhelmed. I, you know, you spoke so confidently and boldly and you critiqued IDS fellows. Well done. You go, girl. Well done, all of you. I thought it was incredible. Um, I thought it was fantastic to hear IDS fellows being told to stop and kept to short periods in their succinct answers. That was a new one for me um, and, and interesting. I, I, th I thought it was this, when Stella asked you what you learned, that was just so interesting, really interesting, your reflections on the process. And, and I have to say, James, listening to what people learned, I, I think we have to make this an annual winter event. It seems to me like there's no escaping it. Um, because I think you learned more. Somebody said we only presented 10% of what we what we researched, but isn't that what life's about? Um, you only presented 10%, but you learned way more than 10%, not just in the terms of the facts and the debates, but you mentioned the friendships you established, the way you thought about data, the way you argue, the way you present. So much, you learned so much, both both intellectually and bodily. And I'm just so proud of all of you. I think you've done brilliantly. Um, Stella, I think you had the hardest job in the whole world and my heart went out to you. I was so glad it wasn't me shutting people up and saying, you have got to stop now. You did it beautifully. You did it beautifully, Stella. You have a, a role to, you know, you did it with such such kindness to the participants. I was really impressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think Mick and Martin, thank you too for being here tonight. It's a late night. You've obviously worked hard and committed as well and put your time into this as well. So thank you as well. Um, and I'm sure the students benefited from having those discussions with you and hearing your perspectives as well. And thank you, Wei, for the, for the cheating question that was hidden in there. I'm glad it was delivered to Mick and not to anyone else. Um, James, massive thank you to you and Marcelo. It was your ideas that sparked this and made tonight happen. And it couldn't have happened without both of you being willing to invest time and effort and energy into it. But I think, you know, I, I heard that debates, re big debates used to happen at IDS in the 70s and 80s. And then I think maybe they just faded away, but maybe we can start having them again. So I just want to say thank you so much to every single one of you and to the audience for really a fantastic evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Nice to know I was kind when I was telling people to stop speaking. <laughs> My heart was beating very fast. <laughs> I don't know if um, Professor Robert Chambers is in the, in the house. It would be nice to, to hear his voice if he is here. No? No, I don't think so. No, no. Okay. There was a message from, from, from Peter Taylor Peter's as well. Peter's here, yeah. It would be nice to hear his voice, not just to read his message. Yeah, no, thanks everyone. Um, I realize this is a 
it's a debate, so I should be disputing everything that Linda just said. But unfortunately, I actually find myself agreeing with her. So completely forget the whole spirit of the debate. And, and it's just really great seeing you all present and also, you know, so actively engaged in these kind of collective events. The last time I saw Samira was on Friday in the haiku death match. So she's just moved seamlessly from, uh, you know, creating haiku in the spur of the moment to suddenly, um, you know, being being the speaker against unruly politics. So it's, it's tremendous, the versatility that you're all showing. I mean, I'll just echo um, Linda's comments, really, that. I think you all did exceptionally well. I, I I think I would not have fared nearly as well as many of you, all of you, in fact, in just the way in which you've actually engaged and argued and brought evidence. There's, we've been having a lot of conversations recently about having more opportunities for substantive conversations. This was a really substantive conversation. I think, you know, you've obviously engaged really seriously. I'm amazed to discover that... Um, that who was it? I, I'm not sure. It was uh, Vanessa. You said you you only just started engaging with all this unruly politics stuff, and here you are, you know, arguing uh, exceptionally strongly and clearly, for, you know, your side of the debate. But I think you're you're doing it in a sort of spirit of of um, equanimity and tolerance and eloquence as well, which is what debating is all about. You know, we hear enough horrible and read enough horrible sort of arguments which are completely devoid of facts. I would say some of you slightly manipulated the evidence in a few cases to to help, you know, win your various points. But in the end, you're still staying true to uh, the, the key things that you wanted to bring to the table, either speaking for or, you know, or arguing against. And I think you all did extremely well. I certainly would find it difficult myself in a difficult situation to, you know, line myself up with either of the sides in either of the debates, because I think everyone just really argued extremely well. So again, all credit to you all. I hope it was a good experience for you. Like Linda, I liked the what did you learn question. That was really, really interesting. And I know this year has been a, a really difficult year so far. So I think having these kind of events that brings us together virtually, you know, um, I certainly hope in the future we'd be able to have this in a physical presence as well. That's not to take away from uh, James's amazing ability to manage all the, the technology. <laughs> He's thinking about that. But uh, yeah, really, really, uh, really great experience. So thank you, most importantly, to all of you. And, and really well done. I, I've learned a lot tonight from listening to, to this conversation. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, everyone. I think we're all better off for this uh, this evening's experience. Thank you so much and have a good evening and a great week ahead. Bye bye.